This week is going to be one of those very, very busy weeks. It is bizarre time at St Andrews. On the 24th, which is Thursday, 7 a.m., we are starting with sausage making. All hands are needed, but you need to remember the COVID pandemic and all the rules and regulations that are attached to that. On Friday, from 11 a.m. to 6 to 4 p.m., there's a collection of all the pre-orders that we have received. Please come and collect them from the hall. Saturday, the bazaar starts at 10 a.m. and will continue to 2 p.m. It is a different bazaar. It is a walk-through bazaar. There is no tea garden, no beer garden, no white elephant store. There will be a tombola, but it will all be access control. And so only 50 people are allowed in the venue at any given time. So please just bear with us when you can't just walk through and you can't just pick up. It is part of the campus walk through business device to the Orlando Bridge. All the food stalls will be placed outside under the zero for the tents. So there will be food for sale or the takeaway containers. Okay, that is everything related to the bazaar. Let us now commence the service in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and our Savior. Amen. Amen. Let us now turn towards God, who has reconciled us with Him, because to Him we are precious beyond measure, and together let us praise Him for that with words from Psalm 103. I will begin with the first lines and I'll to the first one with the fourth lines. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless, bless the Lord, O my soul, and, and do not forget all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pulpit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good as long as you live, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works vindication and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is the steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. As the Father has compassion with his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. Amen.
Let us now stand and together confess our faith with the Apostles' Creed. <coughs> I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. 
He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From here he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
rejoicing in heaven, and the one sinner who repents that over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The congregation, have you ever wondered why simple stories like these were actually remembered, passed on from person to person over the years, until one day they were collected, written down, and preserved, for example, by someone like Luke for generations to come? Yes, why did Luke, for example, choose to add these two parables to his collection of sayings from Jesus? What is their significance? On the one hand, they are simple and also short and thus easy to remember. On the other hand, however, I believe they must have had such a profound impact on those who had heard these parables that they just couldn't be forgotten and just couldn't be just kept for themselves. And they must have been central to how the followers of Jesus had perceived his <coughs> mission and his vision. And thus they were passed on and preserved so that you and I may still be touched by stories like these some 2,000 years later. Two parables that are significant also because of the context within which Jesus tells them. And to understand this context a little bit better, I challenge you now to, just for a moment, think of all the scum, all the riffraff you can think of in this world. Do you have some in mind? And now imagine a gathering that is made up of all the low lives you can think of. Maybe the druggie who stands at the traffic light and begs for money just so that he can get his next fix. Next to him, you have a couple of decently dressed walls. Then there's also the finance minister who has robbed his country and his people of millions. And in addition to that, there are some drunkards, an adulterer, maybe a Scientologist, an atheist, a villager, and some other dubious characters all gathered in a room around a table. And now imagine that you, a good citizen, together with some high-profile religious leaders and other respectable individuals within society, and were invited to join this bunch of losers, to eat with them, to sit with them at the same table, and to share your cup with them. How would that make you feel? Slightly uncomfortable? What will you do? Do you want to be associated with people like that? But then, to your surprise, as you look at these people, they're gathered around a table, you suddenly see Jesus amidst the sad bunch of them. And you wonder, what is he doing there? Does he really think that he can change these people? Once a dragon, always a dragon. Once a thief, always a thief. How can anyone take Jesus seriously when he mingles with people like that. In this world of ours, isn't it so that if you want to be someone with influence, then you need to choose your acquaintances carefully. So why does Jesus bother with these losers? A 
Doesn't he have anything better to do? Like, for example, saving <coughs> Israel from its Roman oppressor, or like blessing me, a good person, with health and wealth? Shouldn't Jesus be rather meeting with the Pope to discuss the future of the Holy Church, or come to our nice services, where together we could praise and worship our Heavenly Father? Wouldn't that be more appropriate? No, says Jesus, no. Because these people, the scum of society, are the real reason why I'm here on earth. To go after them, and to bring God to them, and in doing so, to show and teach all of you how God really thinks and works. Because, Jesus says, just think about it for a moment. If you use something that is precious and dear to you, would you not also do whatever it takes to find it again? The shepherd with a hundred sheep, out of which one got lost, knows that every single sheep is precious. Even though ninety-nine are still dead, the one that is missing makes all the difference to him. And the same is true for the woman who has lost one single coin. But the ten silver coins is all that she has. And thus it is obvious that she will also do everything she can in order to retrieve the one that got lost. And so, it is also with God who loves and cherishes every single living person, with no exception. In God's eyes, there is no one who is less valuable than the other, less deserving of His love and grace. Every single lost soul who wanders through life aimlessly, alone, afraid, without purpose and meaning, is important to God and will be pursued by God until he or she is found and reunited with God and the rest of God's flock. Yes, every person who fell through the cracks of society has been overlooked, neglected, forgotten, rejected, abused, and misused the search for so that he or she may be found and brought back to where he or she belongs. And that is with God, in the presence of God, where the angels in heaven will rejoice and will celebrate their return. That is, as Jesus tells us, simply how God is. That is what God does. And that is what Jesus reminds us of with these two short, simple parables. That is what makes these two stories so significant and far too precious to ignore, because they reveal an aspect of God that we as humans often tend to forget. God's amazing grace, which is without limits. Something that describes and the Pharisees have forget, forgotten all about. Yes, of course, compared to the tax collector who betrayed his own people because he worked for the Roman enemy, and compared to the adulterers who destroyed marriages, and compared to the others who had done terrible things and had forgotten all about God's commandments, the scribes and the Pharisees were truly saints in their own right. They knew God. And they tried to do everything by hook. They honored God, prayed to God, worshipped God on a daily basis. They taught the people about God and God's commandments and did everything in their power to enforce these commandments. And hence, they were genuinely good and righteous people. However, they were missing this one thing. Grace, unconditional acceptance and love for their neighbor. And that is what Jesus points out to the 99 righteous ones who thought that they were okay, that they already knew God, but who were in a way just as lost as the one lost or stray sheep. 
And that is the amazing thing about these parables told by Jesus. They challenge us to see the world and its people, including ourselves, through the eyes of God. Short, simple stories about God who has revealed God's self through the words spoken by Jesus and even more clearly through his life and his deeds and especially through his death on the cross, which is the ultimate expression of God's grace and love towards all of humanity. Jesus Christ, who today challenges us to see the world and our fellow humans not with our own eyes, but instead with God's eyes. God's eyes that see much further and far deeper than what you and I could ever imagine. God who looks right into our hearts and who is also asking each one of us now, and you, who are you in these stories? Are you maybe one of the righteous ones who needs to be reminded that it is actually God's will that every single lost soul is found? That God's kingdom is not only for you or those who are already part of God's chosen flock, but also for the lost ones who are in desperate need of love, acceptance, and just a whole lot of grace? Or are you maybe one of the lost sheep who wanders around endlessly through life, who is overwhelmed by all the uncertainty in life, who maybe seeks comfort in things like alcohol or money or power, and yet remains lost and alone? Or are you maybe today the sheep that was just recently found? The one who was the one who has experienced God's love and grace, and who now can't help it but to share this love and grace with others. Or are you maybe all of the above? Sometimes righteous, sometimes lost, sometimes found. <coughs> Be it as it may, no matter who you are or where you are at the moment, just remember this one thing. You matter to God. To God, you are precious and valuable beyond measure. And God, even though you might have given up on Him, will never give up on you. No, for God will never stop searching for you. No matter what it may cost or how long it may take, God will keep on searching because God only wants this one thing for you, and that is for you to be in His presence where you may find comfort and peace and forgiveness and a purpose in life and fellowship and inner joy. And so that you may never forget that. That is why Luke wrote down these words from Jesus. These two short parables as a reminder of God's amazing grace, which transformed the lives of tax collectors and sinners way back then, and still today has the power to transform your and my life and the world we live in. Amen. And may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus.
Heavenly Father, we gratefully stand before you for this offering, and together we sing your praises.
his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor 